A servant and a hireling can quit or find somewhere else to work. A slave could not, for he is owned. He has no ability to choose for himself his life course. He is completely at the will of his master. And as we saw a little bit from the book of Exodus last week, we saw the, the whole fact that God saw the Israelites, the children of Israel, he saw them how they were being beaten and worked hard. He said, I've seen your, or heard your cries by reason of your taskmasters. And yet we find on the other side of the coin, there are those who loved working for their master. And of course, the difference was who their master was. As the, the king of Pharaoh or the Pharaoh or the king of Egypt uh, was their master, he was a ruthless master. He did not love. He did not care. He operated out of fear. He operated out of selfishness. But when God is our master, we willingly surrender and commit our lives to him. But as we have been probing the subject of surrender, we have been challenged to submit ourselves as slaves to God. That's not easy. As I've said many times throughout these few messages already that I at least speak for myself, I know that I'm selfish. And probably many of you, if you're honest with yourselves this morning, you're selfish too. We are fleshly, we are selfish, we live for self in almost every aspect of the word. And God says, are you willing to surrender your lives to me? We just sang as him, I surrender all. And yet maybe far too often in our culture, it's I surrender some. And God wants us to be willing to give everything to his use, to be committed to him. We were reminded last week as we saw examples of Paul, Jude, James, Peter, and others who called themselves slaves. In other words, each of these men surrendered to, they submitted to, and committed themselves as slaves to their master, Jesus Christ. It's one thing to know him as our Lord and Savior, but that word Lord in the Greek language is the word kurios, and it means master. He's not only our Savior who died on the cross, he is equally and more so our master. As we trust in him as, uh, as our Savior in salvation, that is just a starting point of a journey, right? We understand that's where it starts. When we call on him, we repent of our sins, and we place our faith and trust in him as our Lord and Savior, the bottom line, that is a starting point. And then we begin to surrender to him as Savior. I mean, as Lord, as Master, and we begin to serve Him completely and wholeheartedly. And it's all about Him now, not about us. And it's all about doing everything that He asks us to do as His children. So this morning, for just a bit, I would like all of us to make this subject of being a slave a little more personal. And one prominent principle of slavery is this, ownership. A slave is owned. So I want to talk about that for a few moments this morning. So for today, let's look at the subject of ownership and what it means to the believer. Um, I, have to, I have to admit, this week as I was studying out this passage, Romans 6 took on a whole new view for me. And as we read it, I'm going to highlight some things, and maybe it'll take a new uh, twist for you as well and find some of the gold nuggets that God has for us from this. In many of your Bibles, it may have something like this, a heading, a new life in Christ, a new faith in Christ, something of that nature. But if you would follow along as I begin to read in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. It says, what should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. So let me stop right there just for a moment. We know that God's grace is sufficient. We know that God's word says in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now some of your translations may put it this way. Should we continue in sin just because God's grace abounds? God forbid. Or absolutely not. Of course not. In other words, we should not cheapen the grace of God. We should not make light of forgiveness just because it is freely given. In other words, we don't continue doing a life of selfishness, a life filled full of sin, knowing that, well, if I sin, oh well, God's going to forgive me anyway. So he poses this question, should we continue in sin just because we know that God's grace is going to cover it? Absolutely not. He goes on here. 
how can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism, baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. So the bottom line is, and we've said many times, and I'll say it again, baptism has an important picture uh, revolving around it. Um, as we stand in the water, we form a cross, what did Christ do on the cross? And by the way, it is a symbolic, it is a public testimony of what has taken place privately in one's heart. So the importance of baptism is that we stand out and we proudly, unashamedly say, I identify myself with the life of Christ. And as Christ died on the cross, he went under, in other words, we go under the water, we put to death, and we, as Christ raised up from the dead, we come up in newness of life. So it is symbolic of this new life in Christ. I am unashamedly proclaiming to those who witnessed my baptism that I'm a child of God. I have died to myself. I have died to the old life before Christ that is now buried. And now as I come up out of the water, I come up in newness of life. I am a new creation in Christ. So he says, I can no longer live how I used to live before Christ was in my life. There's a change there, right? So I no longer live that way. I walk in a new way of life. I'm a new creation in Christ. So he goes on, and we see how this is going to play into the idea of, of being a slave of Christ. Verse 5 says, For if we have been joined with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And can I say just for a moment, just about this whole idea, the picture that baptism represents, you cannot picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ by being baptized by sprinkling. Just so you understand that the point of baptism is that we are identifying with the life of Christ. I've had many people over the years say, will you baptize my child? Not yet. Not until we know that he has made a profession of faith in Christ. Because baptism always follows belief. And it's always done biblically by immersion to paint the picture of the resurrection of Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, child dedication, that's another subject. Absolutely. I want to see every child dedicated to God. So as we go on here, it says, For if we have been joined with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly be also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished. So he said here, now that we've put to death the old man, the what we were before Christ, sin was abolished in that life. We don't continue in sin just because God's forgiveness is there. We don't continue in sin just because God's grace abounds. No, that life has been crucified, it's been put to death, it is no longer to be part of who we are as a child of God. So verse 7, since a person who has died is freed from, I'm sorry, verse 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished so that we may no longer be what? Enslaved to sin. You see, all of us need to realize something. We are all slaves to something or someone. And God's word makes it clear. We should not be, because of our new relationship with Christ, we should not be a slave to sin. There should be something. We've been set free from that, according to God's word. Since a person who has died is freed from sin's claims, there's the freedom. You know, we talked about just, for a, just briefly about how after a while a slave would earn his freedom. And once he is freed, he is freed. And from that point on, he has the ability to choose because he's been set free. And in the same fashion, as we place Jesus Christ in our life, as we surrender to him as our Savior, we are set free from sin's bondage, no longer enslaved to it. Now, if we died with Christ, verse 8, we believe that we also will live with him because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For in light of the fact that he died, he died to sin once for all, but in the light of the fact that he lives, he lives to God. So death has been, been taken care of. He's no longer going to die another crucifixion. He is living unto God. Verse 11, so you too consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive unto Christ, to God in Christ Jesus. So he sets the record straight here. We are no longer enslaved to sin, but now we're 
slaves of righteousness, we're going to see in just a moment. So verse 12, therefore, here he says it again, almost a reiteration of verse 1. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons of unrighteousness, but as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. So he sets it very clear here. There is a new way to live our lives. And the lives that we live are to be lived in righteousness, not in slavery to sin. He goes on here, verse 15. What then should we say because we are not under the law, but under grace? Absolutely not. Do you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching you were transferred to. And having been liberated from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. Now think about this just for a moment. A couple of key verses here, verse, verse 6 and verse 17. We were once enslaved to sin. And we've heard it said many times in many ways that sin always takes us deeper and keeps us longer and costs us more than we ever expected. We don't anticipate the grip that sin can get on us. You ask a person who's an alcoholic if they thought the first time they took a drink that they'd become an alcoholic, I guarantee you they'd say no. I guarantee you if you ask a person who's been all wrapped up in meth and crank and, and all kinds of other drugs that the first time they took it, if they thought they'd become addicted to it, I guarantee you they'd say no. You ask a person who has a gambling problem, if the first time they made that bet, if they thought they'd become addicted to it, I guarantee you they'd probably say no. Sin always costs us more. Sin always keeps us longer. Sin always takes us deeper than what we anticipate or ever expect. But the bottom line is this, as children of God, he says, you've been set free from that. But here's the key. We find this in verse 6 and verse 7. First of all, verse 6 is to be reminded of this. He says, for we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. You've been set free and you don't have to serve the master of sin. And then down in verse 17, he says this, but thank God that although you used to be slaves, the word used to has the idea of what? It is past tense. It was before you became a child of God. So he says, it's in the past. You obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching that you were transferred to. And having been liberated from sin. So there is freedom available. So in the past, we were enslaved to sin before we placed our faith and trust in Christ. And then we see something else according to verse 18. Now we are slaves to righteousness. Now, he makes it very clear in verse 16. Here's the determining factor, verse 16. Whether you are going to continue as slaves to sin or whether you're going to be enslaved to righteousness, the difference is found in verse 16. Once again, he says, don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you what? Obey. So the bottom line is, it really does come down to a choice in how we want to live. Does it not? You are enslaved to the one you obey. So if we wake up in the morning and say, I am going to live for self, I'm going to put self on the shelf and I'm going to look at, the, look at everything that's wrapped around that and say, man, that self looks good. I'm going to serve it today. And if by our actions we obey what we want to do, you're enslaved to sin. But if on the other hand we say, wake up in the morning and say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to be the person that I, that I need to be before you. Help me to be like Christ. And God, help me to be filled with your righteousness today. And we're going to put that on the shelf and obey that. Then we are slave to righteousness. And the bottom line is, it comes down to which one you want to obey. It really is a choice. And when I'm living selfishly in the flesh putting self on the, on the throne of my life, I'm enslaved to it. And in those moments I say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live righteously, then I offer myself as a slave to righteousness. But I know that my flesh is weak and my flesh is strong. 
at the same time. It's weak in that it doesn't always do the things that I should, and it's strong in the sense that it does the things that I don't want it to do. Just like Paul said. We will be obedient slaves to someone or something. So the question we need to answer this morning is, who are we living for? What are we living for? If God says this should be a part of our past, is it still dominating our lives? If, if being a slave to, to sinfulness and selfishness and fleshly lifestyle, is that part of our life? Is that what consumes us? If that, is that what brings us joy or comfort? Or is it living for God? Because it's our choice. The one you obey is the one that you are enslaved to. And remember, if ownership is the issue, if ownership is the issue of slavery and surrender, the bottom line is, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, you know the verses. He says, don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And next, what's the next phrase? You, say it with me, are not your own. If ownership is the issue, you're not your own as a child of God. And then it goes on to say, you were purchased with what? God's own blood. He paid the price. As we were put on the auction block, Jesus Christ says, I'll pay the price. And he went to the cross of Calvary, he shed his blood, and the purchase price was paid. We don't own ourselves any longer as children of God. We're owned. And if ownership is the issue, then he owns us, and we are subservient to his leading. And in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, he says, to do all to the glory of God. If we're his children, and he says it again in Ephesians chapter 6, he says it again, I think it's in Colossians chapter uh, 2 or 3. He says, not with eye service as men pleases, but doing the will of God from the heart. So as the bottom line is, we follow the progression. If ownership is the issue, he owns us. That's settled, not up for debate any longer. And if he owns us, we're to do everything to the glory of God. Not with eye service because people may be watching us. The children of Israel had taskmasters, and they watched. And if they did not perform, they were beat. But the bottom line is, is that's not the motivation behind our service. Not to be doing hard work when our, when our master is watching us but doing it from the will, doing the will of God from the heart. Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? Present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable form of service or spiritual worship. God says you worship me when you obey me. When we surrender all, when we say, God, you have everything, that's it. It's a one-time give. And we say, God, there's no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, we're to keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Why is that so hard sometimes? I think it's hard because, once again, we're selfish. Why do, why do couples fight? Why is there disagreements between a boss and employer, between a parent and a children? Why is it? Because we all want what we want. We're selfish. And how dare you tell me what to do? I can do what I want. We don't want to be submissive to anybody. We don't like authority in our lives. Anybody enjoy authority? No. We don't like it. And because we don't like it, we fight against it. We kick against it. We're selfish. But do we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing to him? You see, a slave doesn't matter or doesn't get to choose whether or not he likes the job he's given. He has to do it. And he has to do it well or there are consequences. In Mark chapter 12, verse 30, he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. And in Mark versus the other Gospels, he even says strength with all that is in you. It's kind of the idea of when you have young children, you say, go clean your room. And they go in there and they pick up three toys, but they're really 27 on the floor. Well, they picked up some of them, but did they do it with all their hearts? 
No. And you send them back in there and say, do it again. And they pick up two or three more because they're two or three years old or four years old. And they pick up a couple more and they come back and say, oh, I'm done. And you walk in there and it's like, you didn't get them all. Well, I don't want to. I'm still playing with that one. It's the idea of doing everything, not just some of it. We have the idea that we can just pick and choose what parts of obedience we want, want to be part of our life. And as children of God, we are guilty of it. God will say, I want you to serve over here while someone else will take care of it. When God says, I want you to go over here while someone else will do that. And I hate to say it, you know, that's been said throughout the years that 10% of the church gives 90% of the giving. And 10% of the church does 90% of the work. I don't think that's truly the case in our situation, praise God. But there's always room for improvement. Don't have the idea that someone else will do it. If God burns you, you do it. If God lays it on your heart, you be faithful. Why? Because this is the task that God's laid out. Don't, don't wait for someone else to pick up, the, pick up the pieces and do it. Do it yourself. Put all your heart and your soul and your mind and strength in it. And in chapter 13, verse 21 of Hebrews, another interesting verse. In all things, do that which is pleasing in his sight. In all things. I wonder if we get up in the morning and we have this mindset that we're going to live for God this week. We're going to do the things that please him. I wonder if we could wake up in the morning and say, you know, God, whatever you have for me today, I'll do it. Or do we wake up and say, well, it's just another day at the grind and life is just ho-hum and boom, 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 we cry. He says, do all things that are pleasing in his sight. All things. And in the Greek language, all means what? All. And in our English language, all means all. Pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty cool, huh? Simple little concept. All means all. But how often do we do half? I think we're all guilty. Ultimately, the bottom line is this. We're not here to live for self. We're here to live for God. And I don't know how you live your life because the beauty of it is that we all go home to our own places. We all go to our own private little houses and we do what we want to do behind closed doors. But I wonder how often we go home and we take off our Sunday dress, we put away our Sunday Bible, we take off our Sunday shoes, and real life happens. Real life. I say real life in the sense that it's the life that no one else knows, except for your family, the ones who really know who you are. At church, it's so easy, isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, we're all here to do the same thing, right? We're all here to worship. But I wonder if we're really here to worship. I think God wants more of us. I think he wants more of us. Because worship is not just here. Worship is a matter of the heart. And in Romans 12, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. He said, I don't want you to die for me. I want you to live for me. I want your sacrifice to be a living one, not a dead one. I don't want you to spill the blood. I want you to live for me. I want you to expend your energy. I want you to expend your breath, your breath, your life. Go all in for me. And this is your spiritual form of worship or service. And so really our worship should be every day of the week. And our worship should be all about serving others, serving God by serving others sacrificing our lives to fulfill his will. I'm so thankful that God hasn't technically, theoretically, realistically, however you want to look at it, made us slaves with somebody over with a whip. I, I don't know that I could handle that. I just want to lash out and shoot somebody. I'm just saying. Because we don't like authority. Like, you don't like authority either. <laughs> but I wonder how often we just say, well, that sounds great in theory. But where do we live? Where do we live every day? Are we really submitting ourselves? That's a challenge. I say, God, no matter what it is, I'll do it. Whatever burden you lay on my heart, I'll do my best to fulfill it. God, if I need help, I'll ask for it. 
but God, you got me. I'm all in. Every day of the week, not Sundays, not when you have a big event going on, but every day. That's harder. That's real life. And he says, but here's the difference. You're once enslaved to sin, but if we know Jesus Christ and he's our Savior, we're now enslaved to righteousness. And the choice is ours, because whatever one you obey is the one that you're enslaved to. Let's pray.